So welcome all of you to the 26th live webinar on orthopedic principles. Today we have Dr. Krishna Kumar as our guest. As you know, Dr. Krishna Kumar is a limb reconstruction surgeon practicing at Trichur, India. He's fellowship trained and has won several gold medals at state and national level association meetings. It is my honor to introduce you to Dr. Krishna Kumar, who's going to speak on sagittal plane deformities and multi apical deformities today. Over to you, Dr. Krishna Kumar. You yeah. can share the Thank you, Hitesh. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, so last webinar we did on uh, coronal plane deformities of the lower limb. Now today what we would be talking of, we would be talking of two uh, short topics. One is multi deformities of the lower limb, the principles involved in correction of these deformities. And the second would be sagittal plane deformities. Uh, since we have completed coronal plane, we'll, we'll uh, move on to multi deformities first. So the multi deformity planning, everything is similar to that of a coronal plane deformity correction. So you do the malalignment test, then you do the malorientation test, you draw the axis lines, find out the cora, or in other words, find out the apex of the deformity. And here, when you are dealing with multi deformities, you get a term called resolution cora, uh, which I would be discussing in detail in the upcoming slides. And you have an arbitrary line here, which is different, which is, which is an addition to what we already did during the coronal plane deformity correction. That is basically to split the coras. We'll, we'll discuss the, these two terminologies in a little bit detail in the upcoming slides. So this, you can see that this is a bowing deformity of the femur and the tibia. We'll be focusing on the tibia now. We'll be omitting femur as of now because femoral deformity correction is entirely a little bit of a different thing. So this is how you do the malalignment test. One is find out the axis of the entire lower limb and you can see that there is a mechanical axis deviation towards the medial side. Now that is the second step of the malalignment test. You find out whether the femur is abnormal or not. You can see that the LDFA here, that is the lateral distal femoral angle is 101 degrees, which is abnormal. It should be 88 actually. Uh, you look for the tibial deformity the medial proximal tibial angle MPTA is 70 degrees. So you have a deformity in the femur as well as the tibia. So malalignment test is up to this step. You find out the mechanical axis deviation. Then you find out whether there is a, a medial, uh, that is a, a femoral deformity or a tibial deformity. Now in this particular case, you have a deformity of both the femur and the tibia. So now we'll go to the deformity planning of the tibia. You plot the axis, mechanical axis of the tibia and find out the MPTA that is abnormal. LDTA is also abnormal, that is 103 degrees. So you have a deformity in the proximal as well as the distal tibia. So the next step is you draw the normal proximal mechanical axis, that is uh, 87 degrees MPTA. You draw a line which is at 87 degrees to the joint line, MPTA, medial angle of 87 degrees. So that is the proximal axis. A distal axis, which is at 90 degree LDTA, that is the lateral distal tibial angle, a line which is subtending an angle of 90 degree to the distal joint line. So you get a deformity of 30 degrees. And this is actually the cora, the apex of the deformity, which is coming somewhat at the junction of the proximal uh, one third and the distal two, two third. Now, if I do a single osteotomy, keeping this as the apex of the deformity, this cora is otherwise called the resolution cora which is actually the cora of all these deformities of the entire Boeing deformity. So this is the resolution cora. And if you correct it at the resolution cora, what happens? Let's see. You see that the axis is aligned, but what happens is there is a bump on the medial side. Now this is anatomically not very good. Even though mechanically this is fully corrected, anatomically this might create some problems. Moreover, if you want to put a nail through this, it's going to be a little bit of a difficult job because you want to negotiate through proximal as well as distal fragments, which are in itself bent. So how to get out of this? Suppose you are, if you are doing it with an external fixator, well and good, this can be easily done. But if you are planning to do with a nail, you have to be a little bit more careful. So how will you overcome that issue? 
Now what you see here is the resolution Cora. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a third line. And you can see that this red line is the third line, which is passing through the bone and intersecting both the proximal and the distal axis. All right, so this is your, the orange one is the proximal axis, the blue is the distal axis, and the red line is the third line, which I have drawn. It's an arbitrary line. You can draw it in any, uh, in, in different permutations and combinations, but it should be within the bone and it should intersect both the proximal and the distal axis. Now, what has happened is the resolution Cora is, has been broken down into two different Coras of lesser magnitudes. So now I have corrected the, I've done an osteotomy at the distal Cora and corrected it and a proximal osteotomy at the proximal Cora. So I'm instead of doing one osteotomy in the middle, what I'm doing is I'm splitting it into two smaller deformities and correcting it proximally and distally. Now I have got an anatomically acceptable tibia so that you, even if I want to do it with an interlocking nail, I can do it. So this is, this is what you call the, what is the principle behind the older version that is the C kebab osteotomy. Now we'll come to a case example. This is a tibial, uh, it, it was a, actually a developmental deformity, which was partially corrected. And now what you see is the full length X-ray, you have a, a proximal axis, which is extending right from the center of head of femur. The femur is normal. So this is the proximal axis that is the red line. You have a green line, which is the distal axis. And you can see that the intersection is well outside the bone. So this is the resolution Cora. That is the intersection of the red and the green line is the resolution Cora. And the blue line is the third arbitrary line, which I have drawn, which is passing through the middle fragment, but intersecting the proximal as well as the distal axis. So the third line is very, very important. You can draw it through the bone and intersecting both the axis. And what I'm planning to do is to do an osteotomy at two levels. That is, if you see here, I'm going to do a nine degrees of correction at the proximal part and a 16 degrees of correction at the distal osteotomy. So I did it with an external fixator. And you can see that there is a proximal as well as a distal osteotomy and did a gradual correction. And finally, what you are seeing is a fully aligned axis and the angles are well maintained. So this is how you deal with multi-apical deformities. You draw the proximal axis, you draw the distal axis. Many a times what you get is the axis will be intersecting outside the bone or sometimes it will be within the bone, but it will be a sort of bowing deformity. Then you have to draw the third line, which intersects the proximal and distal axis through the bone. That is, it should be within the bone and you divide it into two smaller deformities and correct it. So that is the basic principle of doing a, a bowing deformity or a, or a multi-apical deformity. And that's the follow up one year after fixator removal, everything is united, axis is well maintained. So e even if it is, uh, uh, coronal plane or sagittal plane deformity, your correction of a multi-apical deformity, the principles remain the same. That is the proximal axis, distal axis, and the third line, which is drawn within the bone. So these are the three aspects which you have to deal with when you are uh, doing a multi-apical deformity. Now we'll come to the second part of the lecture, that is the sagittal plane deformities of the lower limb, the principles of correction. Now the aim of this lecture is to analyze the sagittal plane deformities of the lower limb with focus on tibial deformities. Again, femur is a little bit more complex, so we'll deal with it at a later date. But tibial deformities are comparatively easier and plan correction. Now, once you are well versed with the deformities, with the coronal plane deformity correction of tibia in both coronal as well as sagittal plane, it's easier to understand the femoral deformities as well as oblique plane deformities. So this is just a recap. You know what is normal alignment. Then you do the malalignment test, malorientation test. Cora and Eka, that is the apex of the deformity and the hinge. And the final stage is the doing the osteotomy. Now in sagittal plane alignment, the principles of correction are the same, but what are the differences? When you take the lower limb, uh, only hip joint has got any movement when you are looking from the coronal plane. Whereas all these three joints have movements when you are looking from the sagittal plane. Hip has got flexion extension, knee again has got flexion and extension, and ankle also has got movement in the same plane. So we have to consider movement when you are doing deformity corrections. The, so there are dynamic considerations and deformities are compensated to an extent by these by the movement of these joints. So sagittal plane alignment has got uh, alignment and deformity correction has got a little bit differences from compared to what it was on the coronal plane. So what is the mechanical axis of the limb here? The steps are almost the same. The workflow is same. So center of the femoral head 
to the center of the angle which is actually the lateral process of the talus so if you draw a line from the center of the head to the center of the, to the uh, lateral pr process of the talus what happens is it usually passes anterior to the center of rotation of the knee and what is the center of rotation of the knee it's actually the junction of the blumensatz line and the posterior cortex so that is now this point is considered to be the center of rotation of a normal knee and your mechanical axis of the lower limb it passes anterior to the center of rotation of the knee when the knee is in full extension see this is very important when the knee is in full extension so what happens is ultimately when this mechanical axis when it passes anterior to center of rotation of the knee your knee is locked right so your knee is locked so your quadriceps is relaxed if there is a flexion deformity the quadriceps would be working continuously and will have fatigue okay so this mechanism of shifting the axis anteriorly is in fact to relax your quadriceps and in 5 degrees of flexion what happens is the axis passes through the center of rotation of the knee joint 5 degrees of flexion of the uh, knee all right so this anterior shifting of the mechanical axis is important quadriceps so in in especially for the quadriceps mechanism you might have seen people with polio who are trying to shift this axis anteriorly so effects of sagittal plane malalignment is usually not as severe as in coronal plane these are better tolerated because of the compensatory mechanisms uh, in people who squat usually you see that especially in the indian population you see that the posterior you get lot of posterior osteophytes and posterior degeneration when you are seeing osteoarthritis patients so that is because more load goes on the posterior part of the condyle and of course the muscle muscle factor is also there if there is an alignment issue there is usually a the muscles will have to do more amount of work in order to uh, for the patient to walk normally recurvatum and procurvatum these are the two important sagittal plane deformities we will be dealing with knee recurvatum we are dealing with tibial recurvatum and procurvatum today you get knee subluxations but most of the situations it will be a combination of the bony as well as soft tissue deformities radiological analysis again it's the full length x-ray full length x-ray should be taken in maximum possible extension second radiograph that you have to take is lateral of the knee in the maximum possible extension you need only this much that is the distal end of femur and the proximal tibia and the knee joint spot films of the femur and tibia should be taken wherever it is necessary and you can see that you look at this picture there, are, there is a slight difference between the right side and the left side right side you see that the condyles are perfectly aligned whereas in the left you can make out the two condyles separately so this is how you should take a proper lateral view or both the two the femoral condyles that is the medial and the lateral femoral condyle should be superimposed only if it is superimposed then you see uh, call this as a normally normal lateral view of the knee joint here what has happened is a little bit of uh the reason for this is this girl is having a valgus of the femur also so this is not a true lateral so if you are having an associated coronal plane deformity suppose you see that the joint is a little bit tilted your beam should be uh, your x ray beam should be perfectly in line with the joint line in the coronal plane then only you will be able to get a true lateral view so the reason here is this is actually a normal limb coronal there is no coronal plane deformity so a true lateral has come out perfect whereas here since there is a little bit of valgus it was shot in the same way but the two condyles are seen separately so this is not a true lateral view but it's okay here so malalignment test has got only limited utility because of compensatory mechanisms so get a full length lateral radiograph in maximum possible extension if the axis that is from the line from the center of the head of femur to the lateral process of the talus if it is passing anterior to the center of rotation of knee it is a hyperextension deformity if it is posterior it's a flexion deformity if it is too much anterior that is if it is uh, slightly anterior that is normal if it is too much anterior it is a hyperextension deformity so we'll start from how to plan for uh, deformities now this is actually the uh, knee joint alignment if you take a lateral view in full extension the anterior cortical line of the femur which is represented by this red line and the anterior cortical line of tibia which is represented by this blue line they are actually collinear when there is a tilt towards flexion any tilt towards flexion is considered to be a fixed flexion deformity and 
anything above five degrees towards the extension side is considered to be an hyperextension deformity. So this is the first thing that you have to do. So this is why a spot film of the knee joint, including the distal half of femur and the proximal half of tibia, is a must whenever you are dealing with lateral sagittal plane deformities of the lower limb. So anterior cortical line of femur and an anterior cortical line of tibia. So the deformity can be a bony deformity or it can be a joint deformity or it might be a combined deformity where the bone as well as the joint is involved. Joint orientation lines of the femur. Now this is the joint orientation line of the distal femur. Now if the epiphysis is open, it's pretty easy to draw this. You connect the anterior and the posterior ends of this physeal plate. But when it is, it's an adult, if the growth plate is closed, in most of the cases you will be able to make out the epiphyseal scar. But otherwise you will get a dimple here on the posterior side and a slight dimple here on the anterior side. You connect it, that would be your joint orientation line of the femur. Now joint orientation line of the tibia, proximal joint orientation line of the tibia is uh, actually the connecting the anterior and posterior corners of the of the tibial plafond i mean tibial plateau and lower and the distal joint orientation line is connecting the anterior and the posterior lip of the distal tibia so this is how you draw the proximal joint orientation line and distal joint orientation line when you are dealing with sagittal plane deformities you have something called a modified mechanical axis for the femur as well as the tibia now what is the modified mechanical axis of the femur that is a joint orientation line that we have drawn. Now, modified mechanical axis of the tibia is, of the femur, is a line which is drawn from the center of head of femur to a point which is at a junction of anterior one-thirds and posterior two-thirds of this joint orientation line. All right, so this is one-third and this is two-third. So the junction of anterior one-third and posterior two-third of the joint orientation line. That is the distal point. And the posterior angle between these two is called the posterior distal femoral angle. Posterior distal femoral angle. Now, when you are thinking in terms of anatomical axis, you have a neck shaft angle, which is uh, similar to that of the, uh, uh, the coronal plane. You have a neck shaft angle, you have a proximal diaphysis, and you have a distal diaphysis. So for the time being, let us forget about this proximal part and focus only on the distal part of the femur. You see that the distal mid diaphyseal line, that is a, mid, a line with the, connecting two points in the center of the diaphysis, exits at the junction of the anterior one-third and the posterior two-third of this joint orientation line. And the posterior distal femoral angle is 83 degrees. If you are taking a, talking in terms of tibia, the mid diaphyseal line proximally it's exiting at a point which is at a junction of anterior one-fifth and the posterior four-fifths. So in coronal plane, it was a center which we are we were using as the exit points. Whereas here, these are the two points that we are taking. In femur, it is the junction of anterior one-third and posterior two-thirds. And in case of tibia, it is anterior one-fifth and the posterior four-fifths. Whereas distally, it is the center of the, uh, of the joint orientation line. So this is very, very important. These lines mean the joint orientation line, not at the center, but at a point which is a little bit anterior from the center. And in femur, you have something called the diaphyseal procurvatum also, which is approximately 10 degrees. So all these things have to be considered when you are dealing with femoral deformities. But tibia is relatively straightforward because you have only one axis and two angles. So if you are talking in terms of the modified mechanical axis of the tibia, that is a line from joining the proximal point to the distal point, the joint orientation angle, posterior proximal tibial angle is 81 degrees and the anterior distal tibial angle is 80 degrees. So anything which is above this range or below this range is going to be abnormal. So if it's a procurvatum of the femur, your posterior distal femoral angle will be less than 79 degrees. And if it's more than 87 degrees, it is recurvatum. Similarly in tibia, if it is less than 77 degrees, it is uh, procurvatum. And if it is more than 85 degrees, it is recurvatum. So remember, it is approximately 81 degrees, both for femur and tibia. It is 81 to 83 and plus or minus four is the range. Beyond that, your, your bone is abnormal. 
so you start your now you understand about the you know about the lines as well as the joint orientation angles and from here we actually start planning for a deformity the first thing that we do is the knee level mal orientation test because mechanical axis deviation and mal alignment test doesn't have much of a bearing when you are dealing with sagittal plane deformities so you have to anterior cortical lines to find out whether there is a flexion deformity or a hyperextension deformity then at the knee you find out what is the pdfa and ppta so this is knee level mal orientation test anterior cortical lines flexion deformity or extension deformity and draw the mid diaphyseal lines and joint orientation lines find out posterior distal femoral angle and the posterior distal proximal tibial angle so again it is uh, in, in case of ankle level mal orientation test it is only the mid diaphyseal line and draw the anterior distal tibial angle less than 78 is recurvatum more than 84 is procurvatum right so we will come to one of the simplest deformities on the sagittal plane that is a mid diaphyseal deformity now what is the first thing that we do we draw the axis and the joint orientation lines so axis is from a point which is 1/5 from anterior to the central point of the angle and now you can see that posterior distal anterior i mean posterior proximal tibial angle that is ppta is 60 degrees which is less than normal so what is the next thing that you do you do the draw the mid diaphyseal line of the tibia and joint orientation line and see whether this angle is normal or not now it is 81 degrees so that means here you don't have any deformity proximally this line and the joint orientation line is in the proper orientation so 81 degrees of ppta now what you do is draw the distal axis line and the distal joint orientation line and check whether your adta is normal so here the adta is 82 degree was just well within the normal range so this is a uniapical deformity magnitude is 40 degrees and it is corresponding with the obvious deformity so what will you do now you do an osteotomy and correct it the osteotomy rules are again the same as that of coronal plane deformities so it's a uniplanar deformity you correct it with a single osteotomy here i have used the osteotomy rule 1 where the cora the axis the hinge as well as the osteotomy is at the same level now this is proximal deformity now what happens when the proximal deformity here it was a diaphyseal deformity so you were able to draw the axis lines mid diaphyseal lines of the proximal and the distal fragment but when you come to a juxta articular deformity it will be difficult to draw the mid diaphyseal lines so what will you do here first you check what is the ppta it is 72 degrees which is abnormal so there is a procurvatum deformity so from that joint orientation line this blue line i don't know whether you are able to make out that there is a blue line which is a joint orientation line and from that at an angle of 83 degrees i am drawing the proximal mechanical axis proximal axis proximal anatomical axis so either you can use the mid diaphyseal line if it is possible in case of mid diaphyseal deformities and in juxta articular deformities what you can do is you draw the joint orientation line first take a take a point which is at a junction of anterior 1/5 and posterior 4/5 at an angle of 83 degree posterior you draw a line that is that corresponds to the proximal axis distally you draw the distal mid diaphyseal line check whether adta is normal or not with respect to this mid diaphyseal line you can see that the anterior distal tibial angle is 82 degrees which is well within the normal range and this is how we do the osteotomy and correct it you can you uh, see that here this is the cora i have kept the hinge there itself but i have done an osteotomy at a slightly distal level, lower level because i want to avoid the tibial tuberosity here so what has happened is in that attempt there is a slight translation anterior translation of the distal fragment but the axis is well aligned so here i have used osteotomy rule 2 where the cora and eca are at the same point but my osteotomy is at a slightly different level distal deformity again the steps are same you draw the axis and see what is the adta and uh, i mean uh, P, uh, ppta and adta here the uh, posterior proximal tibial angle is normal it's uh, 78 degrees and anterior distal tibial angle is 69 degrees which is abnormal so it's a distal deformity so the proximal axis is actually the mid diaphyseal line i'm checking the relation with the joint orientation line and it is 79 degrees within normal range so i can take the mid diaphyseal line as the proximal axis next 
is i draw the distal joint orientation line at an angle of uh, the of 81 degrees i draw a distal axis and find out that there is a 10 degrees of deformity between the two axes so this is how i am planning to correct it i am again using osteotomy rule 2 because this is too much distal this is very close to the angle joint so i will not be able to do any osteotomy here even if i am using a locking compression plate my osteotomy can't be this distal so i am doing the osteotomy a little bit proximal and correcting the deformity and here you can see that there is a little bit of anterior translation which is acceptable so we'll come to a couple of case examples so this is the first case that's a 13 year old girl she is an athlete with a left knee deformity you can see here that the anterior cortical line of the femur this is the x ray in full extension this is actually a siam picture it's an x ray in full extension there is a little bit of you can see that there is a hyperextension deformity here the red line represents the anterior cortical line of femur and the green line represents the anterior cortical line of tibia and you can see that there is a 21 degrees of re hyperextension deformity here 5 degrees is normal but beyond 5 degrees it is abnormal so 21 degrees now these are the steps of planning this is this is the tibial axis which i have drawn and i see that ppta is 98 degrees the normal should have been 81 degrees so there is a 17 degrees of deformity and this 17 degrees is corresponding with the hyperextension deformity that which i have found out here this is 21 21 minus 5 is 16 so 16 and 17 are pretty okay so the deformity here in this particular knee is because of the tibial recurvatum component so again now since this is a juxta articular deformity what i am doing is i am taking a proximal a joint orientation line and from that at a specified angle of 81 degrees i am drawing the proximal axis distally i am taking the distal mid diaphysial line and this is this is the cora that is the cora is lying very proximal it's almost at the level of the tibial tuberosity so what i am doing now is i am planning to do an osteotomy slightly lower down but i want my axis to be aligned so i am using the osteotomy rule 2 the cora is here i have kept the hinge also in the proximal most proximal uh, that is the intersection point but my osteotomy is slightly distal to the tuberosity and uh, this is this is i'm what i'm planning to do so i have found out the recurvatum is on the tibia i have drawn the proximal axis distal axis found out the cora and the degree of deformity and used osteotomy rule number 2 for performing the correction all these are done preoperatively either using softwares or you can do it on x ray tracings and that is post correction right and now when you draw the anterior cortical line of femur and anterior cortical line of tibia they are actually straight so this is a knee joint x ray in full extension that's another case it's a 26 year old male who had an infected non union for which an elisero was done and lengthening was done the fracture had united the length was also fine but what happened is there ha there appeared to be the patient appeared to be having a uniform bowing of the tibia in the sagittal plane and as a result of this his heel was not touching the ground so it was a sort of equinus deformity but the reason was in the tibial shaft so that's again the planning you draw the axis and see so ppta is 53 degrees so there is an abnormality there so that is the proximal uh, and the ldta is normal i mean adta is almost normal so what i am doing now is i am doing uh, drawing a proximal axis at a ppta of 83 degrees then i am drawing a distal axis that is i have used the distal mid diaphysial line here of this particular fragment that is the lower third of tibia i have used the mid diaphysial line and adta is 81 degrees it is normal here what happens is this is what we discussed during our multi apical deformities the cora is somewhat outside the bone the intersection is happening outside the bone so this point is what is called the resolution cora which is the intersection points of the proximal and the distal axis now if you want you can do an osteotomy here and correct but that won't be anatomically very appealing so what we do is we draw a third line this blue line is my third line which is passing through the bone and intersecting these two axes so a 42 degree deformity is now split into a 34 degrees of proximal deformity and a 7 degrees of distal deformity so the magnitude of correction becomes is equal but it is corrected in two different parts of the bone so it becomes lesser deformities on proximal as well as lesser degree of deformity proximally as well as distally so this is my plan i'm planning to do a proximal and distal osteotomy and correct it so proximally i will be doing almost uh, at the cora but probably is likely lower than that because i want to avoid the tuberosity and distally 
again uh, it will be done at the cora distally i can do at the cora because the bone here is healthy so that is how the final correction is and now you can see that the heel is touching the ground so equinus was not due to ankle issue it was basically due to a bowing deformity of the tibia so that is how you correct the sagittal plane deformities now before i end i'll i'll uh, i'll end with a little bit a word of caution here anterior cortical lines should be collinear that is something which we all know now anything more than zero towards the direction of flexion is flexion deformity and anything more than 5 degrees towards extension is a hyperextension deformity so if your degree of deformity that you find out here is equal to the bony deformity that you measure then it's fine it's it's a, it's a purely bony problem but if it is different then what what it in, uh, infers is in addition to the bony deformity you have something in the joint also right so there might be a joint contracture or a joint laxity so if the joint orientation angles of femur and tibia are normal that is if you plan for femur and tibia and you see that there is no bony deformity but still there is a flexion deformity or a hyperextension deformity in the when you draw the anterior cortical lines that means the deformity is purely within the joint either a laxity of the joint or a contracture of the joint but most of the situations what you see is a bony deformity along with a joint contracture or a hyperextension deformity it's a little bit more complicated topic we'll deal uh, with it at a later date so basically uh, now we finish the coronal plane as well as the sagittal plane deformity correction and once you learn the coronal and uh, sagittal plane deformity correction aspects of the tibia it's actually easy to remember easy to learn femur as well as the joint deformity corrections thank you thank you krishna once again for a splendid lecture thank you covered almost everything there are a couple of questions like uh, how do you approach a patient with a pterygium syndrome of the knee that is someone with a flexion contracture yeah uh, see the pterygium uh, syndrome is something which is uh, a little bit more complicated than a pure bony deformity correction because the problem here is mainly with the soft tissues and the most critical structure that you have to deal with when pterygium syndrome is actually the vessel and the nerve so when you are doing a deformity correction what you are actually doing is lengthening the nerve and the vessel so first thing that you have to do is you need to do a thorough soft tissue release there so thorough soft tissue release and and you find out which all structures are actually uh, tethered and then uh, apart uh, other than the nerve and the vessel you can release the contracted structures then you have to put on what we usually do is we then put on a frame and then gradually lengthen it and it, it has to be a very slow lengthening so that is how you should approach it to region the it's basically a joint problem sometimes there are associated bony deformities in the distal femur or the proximal tibia but that which you can correct it uh, simultaneously when you are when you are doing it with the ring fix it and i don't think you can do it with any other thing the implant has to be a ring so you mean that it should be a slow and gradual correction right very slow because the critical structure is actually the nerve you are not doing anything with the bone there it's basically lengthening the nerve okay so do you mean to say that you need to do an open release and then a stage correction or yeah. just put an elisa it's an open open first is it's an open release and then mm -hmm. uh, uh, the same setting you can close it and apply a ring fixator and using hinges you can gradually keep on stretching that perfect okay the other one was actually not exactly related to this topic someone wants to know what is the how more about the taylor spatial frame so what is it different from Uh, the conventional elizarov technique uh i'm i'm not a person who's using taylor spatial frame or in fact who has uh, any experience with taylor spatial frame but i use other six axis systems i use the german hexapod and the ortho suv the principles involved with all these uh, six axis correction systems are the same uh, so even if you are using a taylor spatial frame or an ortho suv the basic principle is same it, it works on the principle of a virtual hinge so every explaining everything in detail would be a little bit difficult thing but the the essence of any six axis system is a virtual hinge so all these planning everything is same your pre operative planning everything is same your execution during during surgery is also same you pre construct a frame put on a ring fixator and then once you take the patient out of the theater probably i, I do it for gradual corrections i take uh, the patient out of the theater and after 48 hours while i do the first dressing i apply the six axis correction system on to that and then 
uh, you have a computer software which calculates all these axis positions of these uh, struts. You have six struts in there. All six axis systems has got six struts. Positions of these struts, length of these, so you have to input a few values into that, into the software. There are certain things which you have to input. Rest of the things the software calculates for itself and it gives you a distraction protocol. The only difference between a Taylor spatial frame and uh, other six axis systems are Taylor spatial frame, you have to apply it on table when you are operating on it. It has got its own rings and struts. It's a single use system, whereas others can be reused. So what happens is the hinge that we calculate here, instead of that, it is the software which calculates a hinge in three dimensional space. So it's a virtual hinge. Okay. So that is the basic essence of a six axis system. Yeah, I think that explains a lot of things. But you know what, they may want to really see how it is done. Maybe you in future, if you have a short lecture on how do, how do you do the calculations and in case you have it, we can have a lecture later on. Uh, that can be done, but I don't know how much uh, everyone would be uh, benefited with that. Yeah. Because no, you no, need to they want problem. to understand. No, it's just that they want to understand what is a TSF and what is the difference between your ortho SCG and the German. Yeah, that can be done. That can be done on a, uh, you can do that. We'll do that later. Okay. I think there are no more questions, Krishna. Right. And, uh, thanks once again for that uh, very entertaining lecture, actually, because this is something that's very difficult to understand and it's not uh, commonly taught during our post-graduation. So it takes some time. This is something which is uh, usually neglected during our PG days. Yeah, no one uh, discusses about all this. Usually we later learn it later on after attending all the deformity courses. Even I have attended a three-day deformity courses. I mean, course with you. I think you were there once. When yeah, I all the time. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you, Krishna, once thank again. You. And uh, yeah, we look forward for more later on. Thank you so much for spending your time with us.